computer speakers. All participant lines are muted. Note the engagement icons on the left side of your screen. A copy of today's presentation is available in the handout section. To ask a question, enter it in the Q&A box. Welcome to today's webinar titled Contractor Licensing Compliance Deconstructed that's taking place Tuesday, March 14, 2023. I'm Aisha Stewart and I will be your moderator. Please note, following today's webinar, there will be a few survey questions that I will be sharing with you. In addition, a link to the recording will be sent out post-communication email. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, John Randazzo, business consultant for CT. Welcome, John. Thanks, Aisha, and good morning to all those on the West Coast. Good afternoon to all those on the East Coast attending, and welcome to CT's webinar on contractor licensing. I'm super excited to share this presentation with you today, as I know how challenging contractor licensing can be. From the changing rules to the complexity of initial filings and maintenance, it's tough. I've experienced challenges with contractor licensing both professionally and personally. Personally, my first exposure to contractor licensing happened when I set off to build my own log cabin in the Colorado mountains about eight years ago. I bought some land, ordered a log cabin kit, then went to apply for a building permit. I discovered that I could act as a general contractor since I was building on my own property. And from there, I hired a subcontractor to do the foundation work. However, I quickly realized I was way in over my head as there were specific requirements for plumbing, septic, and general living. Having an outhouse wasn't going to cut it in Park County, Colorado. So about a third of the way of building the shell, I threw in the towel, applied to the TV show Tiny House Nation, hired a professional contractor to finish the work I started, and the rest is history. From the experience, I learned that contractor licensing and building permitting is very complicated and requires a great deal of planning and expertise. So that's my little background personally. And uh, for today's agenda, we're going to start with uh, some background. When do I need a contractor license and what are the triggers? We'll look at selection. What are the different types of contractor licenses and how to best select the appropriate one? Classifications, project value type of construction can all play a factor in selecting the appropriate type of contractor license. So we'll dive into that area. We'll look at the requirements. What is needed to obtain a contractor license? Understanding jurisdictional requirements and nuances can be very challenging to many companies. We'll look at the process. How about how to go about procuring a contractor license? Is it as easy as filling out an application and sending in a check? I don't think that's the case. We'll look at timing as well. And then last, we'll conclude with maintaining uh, compliance and managing changes. Generally, I see uh, there's a lot more focus on procurement of a license and maintenance, and we'll re we will review best practices for ongoing management of your licenses and the importance of keeping your licenses uh, in compliance. So with that said, we have a lot of content, and uh, let's get after it. It was just a little delayed. Let me go back a slide. Sorry about that. All right, so uh, do you need a contractor license? This is a simple question with a complex answer. First, depending on the details of your project, it may be illegal to operate without one. And the risk of noncompliance can be pretty harsh, both financially and through enforcement actions. The next consideration you have is public image and professionalism. Holding a valid contractor license displays competence, professionalism, and experience. I think it helps ensure confidence in your customers, that you're a reputable professional company, you have met the mandatory minimum specifications for your line of work. And you know, many states list pre-qualified contractors and licensed contractors on their website, so you can actually review who's qualified, who's made it through the licensing uh, requirements to operate in our state. And some states actually list uh, violators, so you don't want to be caught on the wrong side of uh, your compliance there. I think next uh, consideration, 
on uh, whether or not you need a contractor license is financially. There's really a lot at risk when doing construction work, from labor costs to materials to permitting process. Uh, so there's a lot at, at stake financially, and if disputes arise, um, filing a mechanics lien can help protect and enforce your payment rights. However, note that many jurisdictions will not permit filing or enforcing a mechanics lien without first being properly licensed, and they may not give you standing in court as well without that uh, license. In general, uh, professional licenses are required for commercial and residential contractors, plumbers, electricians, HVAC, remediation services, and transportation. Everything that's pretty, you know, has complex uh, requirements around those types of uh, businesses and industries. All right. So um, in terms of do you need a contractor license, I think it's good to start with a, a foundation and a general definition. California defines a contractor as all businesses or individuals who construct or alter any building, highway, road, parking facility, railroad, excavation, or other structure in California must be licensed by the California, California Contractor State License Board. It's a total cost between labor and materials, of one or more contracts on the project is $500 or more. Contractors, including subcontractors, specialty contractors, and persons engaged in the business of home improvement must be licensed before submitting bids, an important distinction there. Licenses may be issued to individuals, partnerships, corporations, LLCs, or joint ventures. So pretty standard definition on a contractor license in general. I think there's several factors to consider when determining if you need one. First, the requirements vary by state. There's unfortunately no centralized uh, authority covering all states, so it is individualized. And the first consideration you want to look at is, are you going to be listed as the primary on a construction contract? Are you acting as a contractor? Then the state rules would apply. Next, you'll look at what type of contractor are you? Are you general, specialty? The type of contractor you're operating as often will impact the requirements. Take, for example, Colorado. There's no state board or state license for general contractors. However, plumbing and electrical contractors require state-issued licenses from the Department of Regulatory Agencies. So the type of contractor uh, that you're going to be operating as will often impact that uh, determination. In addition to having a general contractor requirement, some states provide limitations to the contractor license based on a classification system. California provides four primary classifications. They are general engineering contractors, general building contractors, residential remodeling contractors, and then the last category is specialty contractor with I think over 20 subclassifications within that uh, category. Oh, sorry, I skipped over one. The, the third uh, consideration is um, what type of work are you doing? Commercial, residential, home improvement, building from the ground up that will uh, impact the type of license required. And last is, what's the total value of the project and material? Uh, this may have a big impact on the type and class of license. And I want to share an example with you that was just brought to my attention, and actually a, an example of uh, ever-changing laws in the uh, construction contractor uh, business. The state of Vermont recently passed a law that takes effect on April 1st, 2023 requiring residential home improvement contractors, both individuals and businesses, to register with the State Office of Professional Regulation when contracting with homeowners to perform construction in excess of $10,000, including labor and material. So even if you're doing work for family or friends, if you have a contract that's over $10,000 in value between uh, you know, labor and materials, you need to register um, with the professional regulation uh, board. So um, project value can also impact uh, the need for a contractor license significantly. 
Moving on, um, some states require contractor licensing while other states uh, require registration or certification. The uh, definitions can vary by state, but generally speaking, when we're talking about licensing, it involves passing exams, meeting certain criteria and competency in a trade. Licensing is typically the most time consuming and arduous and complicated process to become compliant. Lots of rules and regulations around that. Next is uh, registration. Some states require a simple registration to perform work as a contractor. Montana is an example. They charge $70 for registration fee covering two years and it's a basic one page application. Fairly simple process. And the last is certification. Not generally required in most states unless your contractor trade has underlying health, safety, or environmental impacts. Some examples of certification would be working with asbestos, lead, paint, mold abatement, and removal and cleanup. All right, looking at uh, licensing selection and the types of contractor licenses out there, many jurisdictions really have a variety of quote unquote contractor license types available. The city of Chicago defines a general contractor as any person who has an investment for compensation or with the intent to sell or to lease, arranges or submits a bid or offers to undertake or purports to have the capacity to undertake or undertakes through him or himself or through others to erect, construct, alter, repair, move, install, replace, convert, remodel, rehabilitate, modernize, improve, or make additions to any building. So pretty detailed description there for a general contractor uh, with the city of Chicago. I think um, from a high level, being a general contractor is similar to being a business owner. You're the one negotiating the deals, you have clients, you're working for yourself, you're rewarded on your own work and merits, and again, you're listed as the primary on a contractor, on a contract. Um, if we look at subcontractors, these work on a contractual basis. They're hired subcontractor to do, oh, as an example, uh, back to my story, I hired a subcontractor to do the uh, foundation work on my cabin. It was a specific uh, job that I hired him to. I was a general contractor. He was the, uh, the subcontractor. The subcontractor offers a particular set of skills, usually with specialization, for example, a roofing contractor. And they form agreements with the contractor, not the customer. That's a really important distinction. They're not um, you know, working with the customer, they're working with the general contractor. However, uh, sometimes we see a gray area on whether a subcontractor can be treated as an employee of the general contractor. The courts have considered many factors on this topic, um, including behavioral control to start with, which evaluates whether you have the right to direct and control how the work is done. Are you doing training and instructions, for instance? The next uh, element is financial control. The courts have considered whether you have the right to direct, to direct and control the economic aspects of the work. Is there significant investment, expenses, and opportunity for profit and loss? And last is the relationship of the parties. Of course, look at how you and the worker view your relationship. Are there employee benefits? Are there written contracts? What's the relationship? That's your subcontractor. Last uh, area here is the handyman journeyman uh, versus a contractor. Handyman has no licensing or certification, generally speaking. Their work involves small jobs, quick repairs, or work uh, valued under a certain dollar amount but the laws do vary by state. Contractors differ from handymen in that they are involved in major work, which usually involves a bidding process. Most states have what's called a minor work exemption or handyman exemption. California, it's any work uh, under $500 for that exemption. Um, worth noting though, that even though you're operating as a handyman, there still may be uh, liability insurance uh, requirements. Some states require that the handyman have liability insurance for protection to the business against lawsuits or to other financial repercussions. All right, uh, continuing on with licensing selection and types of contractor licenses. You know, in addition to general contractors, there are several types of other contractors, such as electrical contractors and specialty contractors. Electrical contractors have varying license types and usually coincide to their experience level. Let's take, for example, 
in order to apply for a master electrician license in Colorado, you must verify 2,000 hours earned in at least one year of planning, laying out, and supervising the installation of electrical equipment for light, heat, and power. Licensing rules for electrical contractors vary by state and often include standard classifications, such as a limited restricted license, an intermediate electrical contractor license, and uh, the big one, unlimited unrestricted licenses. When we look at uh, specialty contractors, simply put, uh, specialty contractors have unique or specialized construction-related skills, and also their main contracting business involves the use of those specialized skills. A crane operator is a good example of a specialty contractor. You probably don't want to hire a drywall contractor uh, to run a crane, for instance. All right, moving along. Looking at contractor licensing requirements. Um, when you go to evaluate licensing requirements, I think one of the first and primary considerations is whether the authority is at the state, the local level, or both. If the licensing authority is at the state, your license will generally provide coverage throughout the state. However, if it's not at the state, you need to evaluate local authority requirements based on the project location. And if the project involves multiple locations, you may need individual licenses for each. So perhaps you're working in several different counties uh, with a, a government agency. Um, you may need specific licenses on the local level for each of those unique locations. When we look at the state level, uh, authorities which oversee contractor licensing vary considerably. They can range from contractor boards, the Department of Regulation, to the Secretary of State and Consumer and Regulatory Affairs. I think determining contact information on contractor licenses can be challenging. And uh, there are some resources out there. Um, if you saw in the, um, in the resource area of this uh, interface, we did post a all-state chart on general contractor requirements that lets you know whether the uh, licensing requirement for a general contractor is at the state level, the local level, or both state and local with uh, information on the contacting authority, links to their websites, phone and email information. So you may find that helpful. All right, next um, is a license required to bid on a project. Um, this is actually a really important consideration. Online marketplaces, referral services have, cons have caused some confusion around this topic. You know, your home advisors, your Angie's List. Um, this may seem innocuous, but it, again, it's an important consideration because bidding without a license, even advertising, can be criminal. Um, and there is a decent amount of time and expense in getting licenses, so you want to understand and, and be sure that um, you can bid on a project um, and know whether or not that requires licensure. Um, some other considerations on, um, on this topic is what's the likelihood of winning the bid? Is this a one-time project or is there more opportunity down the road? And uh, as an example, uh, in California, it's a criminal misdemeanor for any person to even advertise for construction work or work of improvement unless that person holds a valid license in the classification so advertised. If you're a business of home improvement, you must be licensed in the appropriate trade before advertising or submitting bids for construction and construction-related services. The license requirement is for jobs that total $500 or more in labor materials, so a pretty low threshold. And I'll review a, a little sting operation later on when we talk about um, what's at risk. Um, home improvement salesperson registration, if you're just the salesperson for a company um, in California, it's required that uh, if you're engaged in the business of soliciting, selling, negotiating, or executing contracts on behalf of the licensee for home improvements to uh, be registered. So um, really important distinction. You want to make sure you understand the bidding uh, rules before you, you start submitting bids because it could have um, some consequences both financially and um, from a, a legal perspective. All right, moving on. Next, we're going to look at some general requirements to obtain a contractor license. And there's uh, quite a few bubbles, as you see here on the screen. Uh, contractor licensing is, is pretty uh, complex. There's lots of little um, 
intricate uh, parts to getting a license. And um, generally, they start with a description of the work and service you plan to perform. Um, in some jurisdictions, there may be, like California we talked about, uh, there may be classifications of the license that you're applying for. Um, looking at the city of Chicago as an example, they have a Class A license, uh, which has no limitation to any single contract project value, to a Class E license, which for construction of any single contract project value not to surpass $500,000. So really understand, understanding uh, the type of business that you're, you're going to be conducting and, and some long-term planning may um, dictate which classification that you, uh, you apply for. Um, you'll often need proof of insurance to show uh, proof of workers' compensation insurance uh, to obtain a, uh, and maintain a contractor license, and also liability insurance for the company. Um, this is one area we'll talk on uh, the renewal side that companies often struggle with as well, so uh, keep that in your mind. Um, next area is uh, surety bonds. The bond is generally filed for the benefit of consumers who may be damaged as a result of defective construction or other license law violations and for the benefit of employees who have not been paid wages that are due to them. In California, the surety bond requirement on a contractor license is, is $15,000. Uh, financial statements uh, requirements vary by jurisdiction. California, for a contractor license, there's no requirement. However, in Florida, you must show proof of financial solvency, including submitting proof of a FICO credit score with a minimum of 660. If you don't have 660, there's ways around that in Florida. You can purchase a surety bond if your credit score is lower. Um, work experience is a big uh, challenge for a lot of companies, uh, showing uh, you know the, their experience uh, working on uh, projects of similar uh, in similar nature. Um, this can be accomplished through uh, wage tax documents, through employer contact information, through duty statement and scope of work uh, documents, through prior historical permits and inspections that have been completed, contracts and invoices, and also uh, you may be able to uh, provide some uh, work experience through military training. Um, passing a business law and trade exams is a requirement which will help uh, prove your expertise in an area to the board. These are awful, often difficult uh, area of compliance for companies. Um, there are uh, opportunities where you can potentially receive a waiver on the trade exam um, if the authority has a reciprocity agreement with another state. So perhaps you have a contractor license in California and you're looking to do work in Arizona. Arizona is a state that has reciprocity with California and you may be able to bypass that trade exam altogether, which is great. Um, another way to uh, get a waiver is you perhaps have a construction degree from an accredited school. Next uh, area, of course, there's fees involved. They're often based on the classification of the license, uh, an important consideration of what types of projects you're working on, as we talked about. Unlimited licenses usually are more expensive than your, your limited scope uh, licenses and limited project work. Um, aside from your contractor licenses, one of the last uh, areas that you want to uh, look at or maybe it's part of your uh, path to getting a, a license are um, look, looking at local level business licenses, often required, and business entity laws may necessitate um, Secretary of State um, business entity registration. CT does also have a, a guide called What Constitutes Doing Business that examines um, corporations' business activities, helps you provide uh, or apply a litmus test to determine whether or not you need to register at the Secretary of State level. Now, some contractor licenses may have a prerequisite uh, to Secretary of State uh, registration before getting the contractor license, but aside from that, there may also be uh, requirements uh, for the business in general. All right, so now we're going to look at the process of how to obtain a license. And I will say, especially you know, based on my experience working with a lot of companies in a variety of industries and, and on construction licenses and contractor licenses, that these are probably one of the more complex licenses out there to uh, procure, maybe um, on the same level as a financial service license. I saw an interesting um, 
fact uh, that California, the contractor board, put out there, of all of the initial applications that they receive for contractor licenses, take a guess at how many of those um, get returned or rejected. The stat is nearly 45% of, of those applications in California are returned or rejected for various reasons. So just goes to show you that they're complex. You've got to get all your ducks in a row. And uh, we'll review some best practices on uh, what you want to, uh, to do to, to achieve that. Um, first, I think it's really important to quantify the details of the project to help identify the unique re requirements. So we've kind of set the stage on this. What's the total project uh, revenue? Um, in most jurisdictions, that's going to include materials. Look at what type of construction. Is it a remodel? Is it commercial? Is it residential? Next uh, area to quantify is when is the timing of the project from bidding to commencement? Because becoming licensed can take uh, anywhere from uh, a few weeks to months. Some uh, boards actually um, meet quarterly and, and approve uh, licenses during their board meetings. So if you've got a project that you need to bid on sooner rather than later, you may be, you may, you know, be out of time. So once you've identified the main components of the project, then you can commence with researching the requirements. You don't want a situation where you've obtained a license that will not meet the parameters of the project. So really getting that foundation of information about the uh, potential project and license ahead of time will, uh, will go a long way. Um, I think another important area are the to getting a, a license, the process is, is understanding the qualifier requirements. And if you're not familiar with the term, generally um, the term qualifying individual and qualifier are used interchangeably. Uh, the qualifying individual is a person who meets the experience and examination requirements for the license and who is responsible for exercising that direct supervision and control of their employer or principles construction operations to secure compliance. So they're the experts really that, that the company is going to be basing their services off of. California, we talked about the uh, reciprocity with uh, Arizona as an example. So understanding those qualifier requirements, you know, do they need a um, certain amount of uh, education or work experience um, will be helpful uh, understanding the process to get their the license. Um, and Aside from the qualifying uh, party requirements, you know, you don't want to limit your research to just contractor licensing. Um, there may be other licensing uh, requirements that um, go hand in hand with a contractor license. So perhaps you're doing a project with a uh, government agency and they say, well, in addition to your contractor license, you need a, a local city level business license to do business with us. So uh, looking at the local business licensing laws is important. Um, looking at tax uh, requirements are important as well. Is there a, a sales tax requirement to getting a license? Um, am I going to have employees working within the state? and Do I need a payroll uh, established for employee withholding and unemployment insurance? And uh, I touched on this earlier. Is there a Secretary of State business entity uh, registration requirement either as a prerequisite to my contractor license or in general for my business? So again, don't limit your research to just contractor licensing. Look at some of the other uh, intangibles out there. Next, we're going to look at a couple of uh, case studies. Um, uh, we did this uh, work prior uh, for a company looking to uh, get a contractor license in San Diego, uh, California, and Schaumburg, Illinois. Um, these case studies involved government construction projects, and to start with in San Diego, we identified that this company would need uh, several different requirements to operate in compliance. First, they would need a, or a state level, the California Contractor State Board, um, license with the appropriate classification. They would need, in this instance, a city level business license just to operate. They would need a Secretary of State business entity registration. Uh, there was a state level with Department of Revenue sales tax registration. One thing to note on those sales tax registrations, if you're doing work with the government on certain projects, you may be able to file a sales tax exemption, and this could save the company a lot of money um, on, on material uh, taxes and, and things of that nature. So uh, you might want to really evaluate, is there a sales tax uh, exemption available, especially if working with uh, government type projects. And last, uh, they needed to uh, obtain a uh, state-level payroll withholding and unemployment tax uh, with Department of Revenue in, in California. 
in comparison, uh, the Schomburg, Illinois project, um, they don't have a state-level contractor license requirement, but they do have a city-level uh, contractor business license. We also determined that the company would need a state-level business entity registration, a state-level sales and withholding tax registration, and finally, a state-level unemployment tax uh, registration. So you see in these two uh, examples, uh, there's a mix of both state and local level contractor licensing. There's uh, requirements for general business licensing, tax, and payroll requirements as well. So just gives you a, a glimpse into, hey, you know, this can be complex. There's multi facets to uh, being properly licensed when you're doing work as a contractor and uh, really unique to the location. All right, uh, moving along. So what's uh, at stake? What, what are the repercussions to not being properly licensed? I think the first one is, you know, you don't want to get caught operating without a contractor licenses as these can be pretty significant. And the first area is criminal sanctions. Um, it is a misdemeanor uh, to a felony in California to operate without one. In California, a second offense is a mandatory 90-day jail sentence. So, you know, they treat this stuff um, very uh, rigorously. Um, there's also administrative sanctions and fines can be nominal, but also significant. In California, first offense can range from $200 to $15,000. Another uh, consequence is negative status. You know, many state boards list non-compliant contractors and some authorities may even go after affiliated companies to impose sanctions. Reputation and image. You don't want to jeopardize a relationship with a customer by skirting the law or becoming non-compliant. Um, so, you know, reputation and image are tough to build up, and uh, you don't want the situation where you're damaging that reputation and image by not being uh, properly licensed. Lost opportunity, I think a really big one that we see quite a bit is just, you know, it takes a while to get um, properly licensed, and sometimes there's a short window of when um, you can get licensed and, and to bid on projects. So, um, you know, op opportunity um, coincides with being properly licensed, and you may not even be able to bid on a project if you're not uh, properly licensed. Payment rights, we talked about this uh, briefly. If disputes arise, you know, many jurisdictions require a, a license before being able to file your mechanics lien. In uh, Georgia, if the contract's over $2,500, then you do need a license to file mechanics lien, and as, an, as an example. And there's other consequences. You could be sanctioned and not permitted to maintain a contractor license or do other work for a set period of time if, if you're in um, non-compliance with uh, the licensing rules and regulations within that jurisdiction. And we'll, uh, we'll see some examples of that in the California slide here coming up. All right. Uh, let's move on. So um, further looking at licensing non-compliance consequences, uh, I have a few case studies on um, two states here, Arizona and California. In, um, if you're operating without a license in Arizona and California, you'd be subject to a misdemeanor charge and fine of $1,000 and up for the first offense. In Arizona, you're not even allowed to advertise as a contractor license without, um, you know, without having the license in, in, in place. Um, in California, the third offense, uh, if you've been a repeat offender, is 20% of the price of the contract uh, in terms of fines. So, you know, these can be pretty uh, extensive. If you've got a million dollar contract, you could be facing a $200,000 fine plus 90 days in the clink. Um, California does also, uh, you know, penalize um, companies for not carrying workers' compensation insurance. So, you know, put aside the licensing uh, requirements, but um, we talked about some of the other uh, requirements that go hand in hand with your license, like workers' compensation insurance. And in California, if you're a, for a first-time offense, uh, suspects could be sentenced up to one year in county jail and or pay a fine of up to $10,000 for operating without that workers' comp insurance. So really big stuff here in terms of uh, consequences. All right, um, you know, I'll start with some background here when we talk about um, enforcement. And really, I think consumer protection is at the root 
of licensing enforcement. You know, many states um, and licensing authorities have significant enforcement in, in programs to really protect the public. That's, that's the biggest, uh, I think, part of the enforcement. And uh, you can see from the statistics posted that there's a great deal of scrutiny enforcement. In uh, California, in, 20, in fiscal 2021, over 3 million in fines were assessed by the board. They also set up uh, task forces and, and sting agencies. And over on the right, you see the Joint Agency uh, Solar Consumer Protection Task Force that was recently established and uh, how they're comprised. But they have uh, big budgets, and they're really looking out for uh, companies that are are not operating properly and you know going after uh, consumers um, illegally. Um, in California, on the Contractor State License Board website, you can actually find details about your licensed contractor, their status, their classifications, their workers' comp insurance, et cetera. You can file a complaint. You can report unlicensed contractors uh, there. So a lot of these states are really uh, big into tech, and they've got all the information uh, to help protect the public on um, being licensed. So just another reason why you want to make sure you've got all your ducks in a row and um, and you're properly licensed because uh, these authorities will come after you if you're not. Um, this Joint Agency Solar Consumer Protection Task Force, um, I was looking at their uh, website the other day, and they, they had a um, an article um, that recently came out in uh, February of 2023 where they um, set up a sting operation in San Diego. This is really interesting, I thought. So they actually had a, a property set up, and they invited uh, contractors to come and bid. And of those that invited, 11 came to the site and placed uh, exorbitantly higher bids, I think, you know, trying to – play off like, hey, we're, we're bidding really high, we're experienced, right? Um, but they didn't have the proper license to back up their workmanship. The bids ranged from $4,500 for tree stump removal to $20,000 for concrete, all above the legal $500 threshold for contracting without a license in California. And uh, so this thing operation, you know, they, they made some arrests, they fined some folks, they... Um, they had uh, repercussions coming out of this, so these sting operations do happen. Sometimes they happen around natural disasters. You know, they'll set up a sting operation if there was a big, uh, um, you know, tornado that uh, devastated some areas, and they know there's going to be a lot of contractors that are coming out to do work. They'll set up these sting operations to really go after those bad actors. So it's really important to make sure that your license insurance are up to date even before bidding or contracting for work. All right, next let's talk about um, ongoing maintenance of license compliance and managing changes. Uh, you know, I think we've spent a good amount of time um, reviewing the importance of um, getting a license and the difficulty of getting licenses and maintaining those licenses cannot be understated, the importance of that. Um, you know, there's a lot of time and expense to procuring a contractor license. You don't want a situation where you find that your license has lapsed, expired, or been canceled. And, uh, you know, over my uh, tenure working with companies, what I typically see is um, some, uh, some substandard record keeping, uh, one area that's pretty deficient amongst a lot of companies. Companies have a partial license list, missing information, there's decentralization. If you don't have proper uh, records, renewal management can be really challenging. You know, you don't want to be reliant upon authorities' notice of uh, license renewals. Uh, some authorities don't mail renewal notices. Some may send it to a corporate headquarters and not to, you know, the, the state in which the work's being done. Some states uh, may have online notifications or emails. So, um, you know, there's lots of ways for things to fall through the cracks if you don't have proper uh, data and, and license information that you're maintaining. Um, and I think in terms of some best practices, um, you want to have some basic foundational uh, information on your licenses and a central repository, uh, you know, a database of record, be it a spreadsheet or a dedicated uh, application where you're maintaining this information. And that should include the license number, the individual qualifier on the uh, license, 
the authority information where the license is held, copies of license certificates, and of course a calendar tickler system. Uh, you know, some jurisdictions actually have a, a pretty unique um, renewal requirement where you can only renew the license within a small window of time. So really having that calendar um, ahead of time is going to help with that. And then also, um, you know, looking at some of the uh, uh, prerequisites to getting that license, which we'll talk about having the, the calendar system is important. Um, if you're managing licensing compliance in-house, I really think it's important to have a dedicated license compliance manager, someone who has some experience with these licenses, um, that they can focus on this, especially if you've got a decent volume of licenses. And um, not only having that expertise is important, but I think it's really important to have um, backup and support. We, we see that time and time again where um, companies come to us, they've had somebody that's been handling their, their licensing for quite some time and something happens, they, they retire, or they move into a different role or they leave the company. Now the company's, um, they have no backup, they have no, no clue of what's going on, what's been filed, what's been you know, coming due for renewal and, and things really can um, fall apart quickly. So having a primary uh, dedicated license compliance manager with ex uh, experience and, and a backup plan I think is really important if you're doing that in-house. Um, another uh, area to, uh, as a best practice for maintaining licenses is um, updates and communications from the authority. You want to make sure that you've got your uh, updated um, mailing address on record with the authority. Companies move quite often. Uh, not only do you want to update that uh, to get notification from the authority, but it may be a requirement uh, on their uh, license to notify them with a certain period of time that you have changed addresses. So that's important. Um, also, um, who's the primary contact at the company for the license? You know, many authorities um, are moving to online systems, so whoever um, is the primary contact, you want to make sure that their their name and their email is up to date with the authority because the authority will send uh, notices and cha law changes to that person, and if you've got the wrong contact, it's just going to go into the black hole. Um, you want to maintain your online credentials. You know, again, I'd say about 50 percent of the authorities on uh, out there uh, have moved to online systems, so it's important to make sure that you're maintaining your login credentials and uh, other information uh, on, on your licenses when you need to uh, do the work um, online. And of course, um, update any changes to the company within the, uh, with the authority in a timely fashion. Um, there are rules and regulations, so, and we'll talk about this on the next page, uh, triggering events and, and how it's important to update those um, uh, changes to your licenses in a timely fashion. But aside from maintaining the, the main license details, there's several other filings that can impact your contractor license and ability to renew. So not only do you have to have somebody that's staying on top of the main contractor license, but there needs to be coordination with uh, perhaps other departments like legal if, if they're handling your Secretary of State registration, um, folks that are handling the insurance, a uh, really important part of, of a license renewal. If you don't have the insurance or the surety bond uh, in, in proper state, that's going to cause issues. Um, continuing education for your qualifying party, you know, there's rules that the qualifier have maintain uh, continuing education on an annual basis in a lot of jurisdictions. So are you tracking those, um, those requirements and making sure that your qualifier is staying up to, uh, up to speed on um, what they have and what's required before the renewal? And sales tax is another big one. Sometimes you can't renew your license if your sales tax uh, filing has uh, become uh, delinquent. So things to consider to some best practices uh, there on maintaining your existing licenses, managing change. Let's uh, look at the next one here. Um, so uh, this is another area where I think companies struggle quite a bit is they've got a pretty good handle on their licenses, everything's running good until there's a change event. Um, these can really uh, impact companies uh, considerably and cause lots of issues. Um, you know, 
it's commonplace for disparate departments to communicate and enforce compliance. Uh, California is a good example. You change your name with the Secretary of State and you better quickly update your contractor license. I think you have like uh, 60 to 90 days to update your contractor license. Uh, with a, a name change in California, and if you don't, they're going to suspend your license because there is communication between the Secretary of State and the contractor board there. Um, rules and regulations vary by authority for managing corporate changes, and I really think proper planning and research is necessary to ensure changes are dealt with in a timely fashion. Some of the typical triggering corporate changes uh, that we see uh, requiring updates are name changes that we talked about. You're going to change a company's name. Operating under a DBA name, um, you know, maybe you want to start uh, promoting your business under a different name other than your true name. That's going to need to be updated on your on your contractor license. Conversions we see quite a bit. You know, from a tax perspective, companies looking to convert from a corp to an LLC. Um, how you go about updating your license, you know, varies by authority and what those requirements are. Some may, may be just a simple update, and like a name change. Others, you may have to file an entirely different uh, application. So really um, doing your homework ahead of, uh, of that type of change is important. Entity merger, ownership changes, this is a, a big one um, that we see quite a bit. Um, there are really stringent rules when it comes to uh, ownership changes and how to reflect those changes with a, a licensing board and, and authority. And if it's not done properly, your license could be in jeopardy. Uh, joint ventures are interesting. Uh, I think one of the areas that we see happen uh, with a, a joint venture is, a, you know, in certain jurisdictions, there there may be a limit to the number of companies that your qualifying party can can sit on. So I think in California, that's three. So let's say you, know, you already have a qualifying party on three of your companies in California, and you want to form a joint venture with another company. Your, your main qualifier may not be able to act in that capacity. So it's really important to, uh, to look at um, that perspective when it comes to your qualifying parties and knowing how many companies they're on and, and what's down the, uh, coming down the, the pike. Um, withdrawal dissolution uh, at the Secretary of State. You know, some companies, once they do that, they may let their uh, license lapse. Not a good idea. We definitely recommend going out cleanly. So if you're no longer going to be operating within a jurisdiction, you want to file uh, a proper uh, license closure. Um, in the event that you ever want to come back to that authority or there's a sister company that's in that jurisdiction, you want to go out cleanly. So there's not going to be issues um, that, that arise down the road. Um, individual changes that may impact licenses, um, you know, we see a lot of companies really struggle with that qualifying party. Your, your qualifying party is on your, you know, your contractor license, they're the expert resource and they decide to retire or leave the company and now you're, you have a, a small window of time that you've got to replace um, that qualifying party to keep your license active and this can be a struggle for many companies. It's, it could be hard to find a replacement. So uh, you want to have some contingencies and backup plans. Um, know, uh, you know who might be retiring or leaving the company and, and have a backup plan to, to fill that role should those changes come, come up in the future. And uh, officer and director changes, uh, these also may necessitate an update to your uh, license with uh, the various boards. So, so keep that in mind. So a lot of different moving parts that can impact your, your existing licenses. Uh, and these are some triggering events that you want to be cognizant of and, and really um, spend the time to understand how these changes can impact your license because you don't want uh, you know, a license to be um, voided or become delinquent because you didn't focus on these triggering events. All right. Um, next. We're going to conclude here. Uh, so we talked about a lot of the challenges uh, with uh, business licensing and um, especially contractor uh, licensing here. Um, CT can provide you with a, a broad range of services to support your company, really the entire life cycle of a, of a license. Um, if you're not familiar with CT Corporation as a uh, provider of your um, company or law firm, we've been around since 1892. 
since our founding 130 years ago, we are the market leader in corporate compliance, and today we're also the market leader in business licensing compliance with the staff, a dedicated staff of 120 employees. Um, our, our compliance services on licensing range from researching requirements, identifying, you know, uh, similar to those examples I provided in Chicago and, uh, or I'm sorry, San Diego and um, uh, Schaumburg, Illinois, we can identify your jurisdictional re license requirements, provide you with the forms, fees, instructions. We can assist with initial license filings, helping you um, obtain the initial uh, contractor license, file amendments to those, close out those licenses. We've got, uh, you know, it's been really popular over the last uh, couple of years, renewal management. We talked about how some companies handle uh, renewal management and licensing uh, in-house. Um, but consider partnering with CT on that as we've got a staff that's scalable and a dedicated technology portal that we use to manage clients' licenses called Click. And just having that partner that is there for you that's always going to be handling your licenses and, and know that they're in good standing I think can go a long way and provide a really strong return on investment. Um, we have a license assessment service that so sometimes companies don't have a good understanding of, of their licensing portfolio. Uh, maybe there, there are some concerns that they're missing licenses and some of them are inactive um, or delinquent. We have an assessment service that can help uh, get things cleaned up for you. So that's a great service. And then I touched on the technology that it pulls it all together is our Click uh, application, which is a really uh, phenomenal um, licensing specific portal for maintaining companies' licenses. So that's a little bit how CT can help. If you haven't uh, tested this out, please give us a chance. We certainly value your existing business with CT. If, if you're an existing customer, look forward to working with you on licensing and supporting your uh, licensing compliance needs. Um, greatly appreciate your time today. Hopefully this was valuable for you. And uh, we have a lot of great uh, content information that we regularly put out there, so check out our website. Uh, subscribe to our newsletter. Um, we're constantly making updates. I mentioned the uh, contractor smart chart that uh, you're able to download uh, today through the application. And as I mentioned, uh, we're going to have to make an update to that come April 1st as Vermont changed their law. So CT has a great team that's uh, staying on top of all the uh, changes, and we have great information out there. So hopefully you'll get some uh, some good value out of that. Thank you for your time today, and uh, thank you for your business. I will turn things over to uh, Aisha to uh, close this out. Thank you, John. And before we conclude, we just have a few survey questions. The first is, would you like to be contacted by one of CT's business license experts? Again, that is, would you like to be contacted by one of CT's business license experts? I'll give everyone a few more seconds before we move on to our next question. And our next question. Please rate the value of today's webinar content on a scale from one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest. Again, that is, please rate the value of today's webinar content on a scale from one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest. And moving on to our final question. Please rate today's present on a scale of one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest. Again, that is, please rate today's presenter on a scale of one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest.
Thank you for attending. This does conclude today's webinar. Have a great day.